Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion on the evolution of the technology stack and how companies are increasingly moving away from one size fits all solutions. My name is Amanda Borjati and I run partner marketing at Slack. I am joined today by a number of our partners, including Rafael Perez from Box, Simon Thorpe from Okta, Slack's own Andy Fom, and Mila Farrell from Zoom. To get things started, I wanted to discuss the current landscape today. Obviously, things have significantly changed since the onset of COVID, and the shift has had a dramatic impact on how we think about technology in the workplace, wherever that might be. Simon, in light of the role that Okta plays in helping employees access the tools they need to do their jobs, what are some of the changes that we're seeing? I think it's interesting with COVID-19, I don't necessarily know we've seen changes in the plans of the IT landscape. It's really just accelerated them. Uh, so companies for some time now have seen the value of cloud infrastructure and kind of seen the erosion of the corporate network as a secure perimeter. And so what happened with the global pan pandemic is with a sudden move of the vast majority of employees to working from home and from remote locations, just accelerated people's plans to migrate their services into the cloud and then also address the challenge of securely being able to rem work remotely. Um, and so in these situations, a lot of best of breed technologies have really been able to uh, step up and address problems of, of deploying quickly and securely um, because a lot of best of breed platforms, unlike the legacy technologies that have been driving IT for the past 20 years or so, um, they were designed to be deployed very quickly and scale very easily. Uh, let me give you a, a concrete example of that. So uh, at Okta, we're all about connecting people to the cloud and securely giving them access to applications. And if we compare ourselves to a, a legacy vendor like Microsoft, who a lot of their technology they have, which connects their on-premises identities, like an Active Directory, for example, into the cloud, they're using 20-year-old technology to do that. Where Okta had the chance to kind of innovate in this space and look, you know, build something from scratch and look at how that worked and enables us to very quickly uh, allow on-premises uh, Active Directory identities to get into the cloud in a matter of days, whereas with Microsoft, you know, even the simplest of environments can take weeks or months. Uh, and the FedEx is a, is a customer of ours that at the start of this year, as the pandemic was ramping up, they accelerated their plans with Okta and we were able to move 85,000 employees onto our platform. Uh, and now they, they protect their VPN access and over 250 applications. That all happened within a matter of days. So that is no small feat at all. Um, and clearly COVID has accelerated the shift, but as you noted, the shift was already underway. So I'll pose this next question to Andy. When are we seeing this light bulb go off? What are some of the other factors that are contributing to companies and our customers making that decision to transition their tools to the next generation of tools available? Well, Amanda, I think one of the key pressures that has been ever present on companies and especially so in this period is the need to get the greatest value out of the tools that they're using and be really cost conscious right now. Um, but cost conscious in thinking about what is the real value that they're attaining from those solutions they're using. And what's really central and critical to that is the engagement, looking at are the people in the organization actually using, adopting, and getting value from those tools. There's no price, including free, that's worth it if you're going to put out a tool that your users don't want to use and won't use or will use very inconsistently. And what we're seeing across uh, all the solutions represented here are tools that organizations and team members love to use and they get a lot of great engagement out of that. At Slack, we see that where our customers will come to us and say, we tried to use uh, another solution side by side with Slack. And we have many examples of customers who say they'll see 10 or 100X better usage, more depth of usage in Slack. And so they know that they're actually getting value from that. Another factor that plays here is the consumerization of IT that we've had for a while in the workplace, where people come in with expectations for a great user experience. They also bring in from other job experiences knowing about these other tools that exist, like Zoom and like Box, like, like Slack, like Okta. And they don't want to set us, settle for a subpar user experience and they'll ask from the moment they come in. One last example I'll give of that is talking with a uh, a prospect this morning who came to us uh, because they had another solution rolled out, but the acquisitions they've been making have all been using Slack and asking for Slack as part of the diligence process and when they come in the door. So engagement and that 
uh, great user experience are really central to this shift. Yeah, so Raphael, given Box's trajectory on this path, um, are you seeing similar behaviors and or you know, contributing factors to why your customers are making these shifts and decisions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of the same uh, behaviors. We have customers like World Fuel Services, for example, um, who are now delivering best of breed content experiences inside of Salesforce via our integration. Um, and they've also integrated it with a, with a marketing portal so that they're ultimately delivering a cohesive CRM experience uh, that's fully integrated to their employees. And this saves them uh, a lot of time. It improves productivity. Of course, users aren't having to jump between multiple apps, multiple windows and services. They're just interacting with everything in the tools um, that, they're, that they are accustomed. But, but interestingly enough, it's not just about um, uh, these enterprise services uh, like Salesforce, ServiceNow, or really any one of us. Um, uh, a lot of our customers are also building their own solutions uh, mm -hmm. to deliver uh, white glove, best of breed experiences for their customers. And, uh, and so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing some of our customers like State Street uh, that are leveraging our platform capabilities, leveraging our APIs to deliver um, a portal for their investors to share documents with their customers. And this is a, a completely white gloved experience, right? Their customers don't know that Box is really powering this um, on the back end. And, um, and so in any case, it's, what, what you end up with is you end up with uh, this, uh, these experiences that their customers are working in the tools uh, and portals that work best for them, but then the back end investors, the advisors, Merrill Lynch did something similar with a with a document vault they created. They created. Um, uh, so on the back end, they're able to to ultimately use the, the employees use the tools that work best for them. But you're delivering these rich experiences for their uh, for their customers. Yeah, and so Mila, I mean, given <laughs> Zoom being at the epicenter of a lot of this recent shift, how, how are these next generation tools really helping customers scale? Yeah, absolutely, Amanda. The best thing about best of breed solutions is that they help companies scale up or down, right? Depending on the cycle that your business is going through, it's possible to buy as little as one license and as many as hundreds of thousands, right? We've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also, because this best of breed solutions are so user centric, intuitive in nature, it's actually very easy to deploy. Um, in many, many times, um, companies don't need to train their employees on how to use a new tool, which actually results into quick adoption and quick onboarding. And rollout and management and maintenance of the solutions is also pretty straightforward. We've seen some of our largest customers in retail and banking being able to deploy, fully deploy our solution in one to two days and then rollout is usually pretty, pretty quick as well. And these are these are wall to wall large deployments, uh, bear in mind, and uh, which, which is extremely important, right, especially when in times like COVID, when it hit a lot of our large multinational enterprises, they needed to connect to their offices in Europe and Asia. And they were able to do that without um, minimal with minimal disruption to their business operations right because they, they were able to quickly adopt this new way of communicating and collaborating and the the, uh, the other big um, reason why they were able to do that is because these solutions as best of breed solutions they fit really well with an IT stack mm -hmm. um, it's possible to plug and play so to speak yeah. right and box and Okta and slack uh, mostly because all of these best of breed solutions, uh, we share a similar DNA, right? It's a, it's a fundamentally how the services were built from the ground up for the cloud, for the mobile era. Uh, like Raphael said, we have a rich set of APIs that allows customers to customize their workflows and really use the solutions in the way that it fits their business need instead of trying to fit so hard in a stack that, that's outdated and that was built um, a long time ago. And that's why it actually leads to scale and it really helps organizations to move really fast. Yeah, no, and that brings us back to that underlying infrastructure that Rafael was talking about. And so Rafael, maybe to elaborate a little bit on that and to note, you know, these tools have been built in the cloud 
Um, can you give us a little bit more of our elaborate, elaborate a little bit more around what is really different about this next generation of tools from what we see from the legacy systems? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so if we begin to unpack what it means to be built for the cloud from the ground up uh, and not having to, to carry that excess baggage from uh, building for the enterprise data center, which is what, what a lot of these uh, vendors have historically been doing, there's actually a lot there. Um, as the companies that built and, and still sell these legacy systems and services look to the cloud, they're largely being focused on, on the quickest way to get there, having to rebuild as little as possible. And of course, that might seem to make sense, right? Uh, that, that might be what we might be inclined to do as well. But, but really what ends up happening is that their customers only get to see the tip of the iceberg, right? So meanwhile, there's a lot of layers underneath the water, such as administration, governance, um, there's like specialized training that, uh, that users need to take, integrations, accessibility of the API. We've talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the ability to scale, right? So often the solutions they offer to these problems, they're, they're kind of like hacks uh, that might impact the user experience or, or even the feasibility of the service to deliver on the outcome the, the customer is looking for. Uh, take SharePoint, for example. Uh, you've got constraints on the size of each site collection. Uh, for, for which you need to plan accordingly. It's 25 terabytes. Um, and every OneDrive, uh, which Microsoft positions as kind of offering unlimited space uh, or unlimited storage for their users, is also capped at 25 terabytes. At which point, then you need to create a separate site collection, right? If you hit that threshold, now you need to create a separate space to, to save content. And, and a lot of this is because of that baggage, uh, because of the initial architecture um, that, that this uh, service was built on. Um, uh, and, and now you have multiple sites uh, without delivering any seamlessly integrated experience. Um, meanwhile, uh, at Box, we've been delivering uh, these uh, seamless content experiences for many of our customers at petabyte scale um, and, and across all these different services like, uh, like we talked about earlier. Yeah, so Simon, question for you. So how do you manage this diverse ecosystem, this diverse set of tools securely and efficiently? Yeah, and I think as Andy and as Raphael have described, it, what's interesting is you've got this comparison of the old IT world and the new IT world. The old IT world, uh, many enterprises were predominantly Microsoft on the desktop. You had Windows, you had Windows servers. And so using applications and making decisions around applications were primarily, does it support Windows? Today, you don't ask those questions because HTML is the new interface, a browser is how you access everything. So you no longer have to choose technologies based on their support for a Microsoft infrastructure. You can choose any technology because your browser is the power. And mobile devices, Apple and, and, and um, Android devices, you know, their stores are full of apps that are easily developed to support these environments as well. So, so the ecosystem of the yesteryear doesn't apply at all to the new one in the cloud because you've got both the browser-based web type interfaces, but then behind all of these applications, you have REST APIs that allows integrations, which you just couldn't do in the old days. So now when you're selecting best of breed technologies, you can choose Okta, you can choose Slack, you can choose Zoom, and you can choose all of these. And each of these companies are integrating tightly together on the back end, so that their experiences as you cross between them is seamless. So using Box inside Slack is a seamless experience, which would have been very difficult to do before with all the, all the old protocols and the old type of platforms. And so how Okta fits into this from a security perspective is now you're selecting these different applications from different vendors. The, the um, standardization goes beyond just the UX to the security protocol. So we have things like SAML, we have OpenID Connect and Skim, which are all ways to allow us to securely provide consistent access and do single sign-on to these different applications from a centralized location like Okta. And it just and, and these standards make Zoom, make Box, make best of breed applications very, very easy to deploy and simple to, to switch on from a security perspective. Um, there's another way to look at this also is that um, we're moving closer to a zero trust world. And what that means is the old model was you had laptops and uh, laptops connected to corporate Wi-Fi and desktops connected physically to the network. And the network then was the perimeter of security. Whereas with all of these best of world applications that are living in the cloud, you can't really trust that network anymore because the network is the hotel Wi-Fi, it's my home Wi-Fi, it's my mobile LTE connection. And so what we're doing is we're moving the trust away from the place where you are connected to and more to identity in your device. And again, there are standards here 
where Zoom running on my Apple device authenticated through an Octa session with MFA is a lot more secure because we're shrinking that perimeter down to the identity, which is a lot better controlled with a technology like Octa. Yeah. So Mila, another one for you. I mean, going back to the role that Zoom has played and really being at the front line of this abrupt transition, what are some of the other benefits of best of breed tools as companies are looking to chart this very, very, you know, challenging, undefined level of uncertainty in terms of what comes next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some of the benefits of best of breed tools is the ability of best of breed companies to move really fast. And I mean that um, we, we've seen that in the most current situation, right? Uh, companies like Box, Slack, Zoom, Okta, uh, we're able to move really quickly and adapt and really adjust to customer circumstances. Whereas very often you see with larger companies, it's, it's not trivial, right, to shape a feature Sometimes it takes large companies half a year, 12 months, and uh, best of breed companies are able to turn around those, uh, those features in a matter of weeks or months, right? So it's, it's much faster. Um, the, the other thing about um, best of breed companies is that they, um, they really understand user experience. Um, in the, a lot of the times, best of breed companies are adopted bottoms up, where um, users actually are bringing the solutions to their companies and they're begging IT administrators to, to actually roll this out in the workplace, right? As opposed to um, the more traditional approach of top down, where uh, an IT manager would decide what everyone should use. And that we're seeing this adoption are, are, happen organically, which is which is pretty amazing, right? Um, Andy touched on the point of uh, consumerization of uh, enterprise, and we really see that happen. Um, and users, now that they're working from home, they they really expect the same experience that they have from consumer apps to have the same experience um, from their work apps as well. Um, and a lot of the time, so pre-COVID, we actually had a lot of customers being hesitant about video communication, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's pretty much became a standard. Um, and um, one of the reasons for that is um, a lot of companies realized um, that it's, it's very important to have this very convenient co um, method of communication, right? Mm -hmm. um, and post-COVID, uh, we, we think that the video is uh, obviously not going away. And it's going to stay here in some shape or form. Um, and maybe some companies even go fully remote, right? We've, we've seen that uh, the cases of that happening already. And, um, and that's really what best of breed companies enable. Um, they enable um, flexibility. They enable co collaboration to happen like never before. Um, and they, they really allow companies to be very, very agile. Um, so yeah, this, this is, I'm personally very excited and in Zoom we are very excited about the future of work and uh, what the best of breed companies will, will bring to it. Yeah, so building on those behavioral changes that are resulting from this abrupt transition, Andy, how does this translate more broadly to the customers that you're speaking to? Yeah, well, Mila actually touched uh, quite a bit there on the agility that best of breed providers have and can bring um, with the solutions that we uh, bring to our customers. And I think extending from that is the need that our customers have for themselves to be very agile, to be responsive, to be able to move quickly. Mm -hmm. They can do that best when they have tools that are built for that, that are flexible and that are getting uh, updates and capabilities that reflect the current needs in the market. And our customers have that requirement. They have to be able to move fast. The market demands it. And there's very clear evidence from things like a new McKinsey study that just came out that companies that can move quickly, that have speed uh, outperformed by a wide margin, companies that are moving at a slower or more traditional pace. And we see this with the companies that have this kind of agility. We talked uh, uh, very recently with a hospitality, large global hospitality company that's a Slack customer. Um, they had everything in their critical systems group instrumented previously in dashboards. They had everything wired up so that in theory, they could know when there were problems anywhere across their network or across their business. But they didn't have a good way of actually bringing it together and taking action on it. Uh, and what Slack has enabled them to do is essentially write their own recipe for how they want to present that information, how they want to connect up to it, 
how they want to escalate incidents into a call with a, a calling service or to share files related to it. They have built this agility now into the way they respond that they're able to bring down resolution of errors uh, that they encounter down to an average of five minutes from what had been two hours. And they're paying up to tens of thousand dollars a minute when they have a major outage on their on their system. So it's a real benefit to for companies to have that kind of agility that they can gain from best of breed solutions like this. Yeah. So we've talked about the capabilities that best of breed tools enable for customers to get through the current state. But and I'm going to pose this to the to the group. Um, and Rafael, maybe we'll start with you, but longer term, what does this mean for companies who embraced taking a best of breed approach? Well, ultimately, I think they, we, we've touched on a lot of it. They're going to gain a lot more agility, um, uh, certainly. Uh, so um, uh, they're, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be bogged down by all this excess baggage. Um, when you really think about it, um, it's, it's actually kind of sad because uh, a lot of companies may not even recognize the baggage that they're carrying because they've, they've been accustomed to doing this for so long. Um, and so, so as they start moving to best of breed services, um, we have customers that are already telling us that they've seen incredible gains um, uh, in productivity, um, in, in freeing up resources that might otherwise have to be spent administering these systems, right? There's, there's companies out there that have, um, uh, I kid you not, thousands of administrators uh, just managing content or sites in SharePoint, for example, um, and, uh, and and that goes down tremendously. Mm -hmm. So so they're able to recuperate uh, a lot of those resources, recuperate a lot of those costs, um, gain more agility, and, and provide better experiences for their employees and their customers. Um, uh, so, I think can I can I also give you a perspective on that, Amanda? I think what's interesting about the decision, like the, the evolution of what we call best of breed. So when customers are making decisions to buy these, sometimes they're hesitant. Will Slack work with, well with Box? Will Okta integrate with these? Will it work inside my environment? But what we're seeing over the past five to 10 years is due to the way that we're building technologies today, having different products from different vendors work together isn't a problem anymore. And so now by choosing a company where their laser focus is on that one capability. So for Okta, our laser focus is ease of access, secure access to cloud applications, right? So we're making sure that your employees are not hindered by security, but get the best in security. And that's what we do day in, day out. Using that with Slack, you have a good experience and Slack is laser focused on the collaborative environment and allowing people to communicate within the organization. In the olden days, you were choosing technologies, maybe a collaboration platform from Microsoft and was identity their laser focus? It was kind of an enabler to make sure that Exchange was working, but it wasn't a product that they were 100% looking for new innovative features and extending that platform. So really, the hesitancy that anybody may have had in the past around best of breed all washes away with the fact that these things work heavily together, integrated well with standards. And the future there, there's just no worries. Like we're always going to see, if anything, we're going to see these technologies getting tighter integrated through just the capabilities that we're bringing through technology alone. Great. And if I could add to that, uh, there's, a, there's a flip to that as well, uh, which is that um, companies that have tried to focus on the suite, like Microsoft, find themselves competing against much of the ecosystem. Uh, the companies here, uh, we, as you said, Simon, we really focus on our specialty areas and we provide the best solution in those areas. We're not out there competing at the same time against CRM or against tech and dev tools right. or against reporting and analytics and all these other areas that cut across. And what the effect of that is, you find that so many other uh, enterprise software providers out there are eager and work very well with, with each of our solutions and can be very wary about integrating with the best of suite type of solutions. The kind of integrations you'll see there will be very basic, nascent, um, often at best and, hard, and, and not well supported. And conversely, the best of suite providers like Microsoft are going to promote you to their stack of solutions. And we're mm -hmm. the, the companies on here and like us, are neutral and as you said, will integrate and work well across uh, all the solutions that a customer chooses. 
Yeah, neutrality, neutrality is an interesting word used there. That's, that's key to the future of technology, I think, especially in the IT space. The more neutral your vendor is, if because what you don't want to do is you don't want to have an email platform that if you suddenly switch to a different email platform, all your other technologies break. You want to make sure that you have freedom of choice for each of the right. key areas of your business to work effectively and not be holding down to one particular um, technology just because all of the supporting technologies are the only way to get that thing working. So neutrality, I think, is really important. And ultimately, who benefits from neutrality? We don't really, as vendors, it's always the customer. The customer always benefits from that choice, and that comes back to agility and flexibility. Well, thank you, Simon. And unfortunately, I think that we are coming up to time but um, this has been a great conversation today. And I want to thank each of you for joining me in engaging in this conversation. So thank you and have a good rest of your day.